All right, I want to welcome everyone to the AdCast. Today, I have two special guests, two of my favorite restaurateurs, Mr. Wade Bowles and his partner, Mr. Brett Yearout. And we're going to talk about their restaurant ventures and just how they are adapting to the COVID-19 times in the restaurant industry. This is the AdCast. You're listening to the AdCast. There's three things that I tell people to focus on. That's your budget, your media, and your message. People don't call it the truth. Every day I'm hustling, 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 hustling. If you hustle, you'll never go hungry. Hustle and motivate. Hustle and motivate. That's why they follow me, huh? They think I know the way. You're listening to the AdCast. All right, I want to welcome everyone to this edition of the AdCast. Like I said... I got two of my favorite restaurateurs, Mr. Brett Yearout and also Mr. Wade Bowles. Uh, and these guys have such an impressive, impressive resume uh, when it comes into the restaurant industry. And also, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what things that they are facing or, or a lot of other restaurants are facing across the country when it comes into COVID-19. So I'd let these guys introduce themselves. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, Brett, go ahead and introduce yourself. And uh, for the folks who don't know who you are or they're under a rock, let's tell them a little bit about Brett Year Up. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having us out today. Um, yeah. So my name's Brett Year Up. Um, been uh, living in Charleston since 1978. Um, my dad was a career military and we landed here when I landed in ninth grade. And um, I had the fortuitous uh, event of moving almost next door to Wade. Um, we became uh, what's now kind of almost uh, probably 40 plus years friendship. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, so just have grown up in Charleston and, and learned the business with um, with his family and his dad over there on Shim Creek. And um, it's truly just a dream come true to actually have come full circle and now for Wade and I to be in business together on Shim Creek is just something almost unimaginable to me. Yeah. Thinking back to when I was, you know, 21, 22 and just in awe of, of everything that was going on in, in Wade's dad's business. And now to, to be uh, Wade not be basically doing the same thing is just incredible. And so, uh, yes, I lived here in Mount Pleasant the whole time. Um, married with three kids. Uh, two of them are in college and one of them's out of college. And we're starting to enter the next phase of life. Uh, empty adjusting nest. to the to the empty nest and although it did not last very long uh <laughs> my oldest son moved out last year january the first mm -hmm. and then my two were off at college uh and then you know all the craziness started and they yeah. were back home so we had 60 days of empty nest but we're just still well it was fun yeah. while it lasted Brad. it was fun while it yeah. lasted how about that short period of time Absolutely. and so yeah just uh been here at mount pleasant the whole time so wade tell us a little bit about you well, so I've lived in Mount Pleasant all my life. Never lived anywhere else. I've, uh, I grew up in the restaurant business. Actually, I'm a fourth generation restaurateur. Wow. How about that? Uh, my great grandfather, my grandfather, my father have been in the restaurant business. And of course, what do I do? Go into restaurant business. Uh, so it's really all I know, man. And it's been, I've been doing it all my life. Uh, like I said, I've lived in Mount Pleasant, been married for. 30 years to an absolutely amazing, wonderful woman, uh, my wife, Mita. We've got three kids. Uh, they're not kids anymore. My oldest is 28, Madison. She's a nurse. My son's 24. He works for an unbelievable family business called Banks Construction. And my daughter just virtually graduated from uh, from Ole Miss in May. And uh, but that, however crazy and strange that's been, but she's... Uh, Looking for so a marketing position, but um, so yeah, I that's what I that's what I've been doing. I'm you know it's all I know is the restaurant business. Been doing it all my life, and uh, very thankful and grateful to be here. And, yeah, man. Um, talk to you, and yeah, Brett and I've been best friends since we were 14 years old. Hanging out, went to school together. Um, uh, we went to different colleges, but in the same fraternity, and we graduated. Uh, came back to Mount Pleasant. Worked with my dad forever, learned from him, School of Hard Knocks in the restaurant business. And oh, uh, in December of 1999, we split off from my dad and been business partners uh, ever since and had multiple restaurant ventures. Some are still around, some aren't. And our latest now is 
saltwater cowboys on Shim Creek. And as Brett said, it's absolutely an, an amazing thing to be back on Shim Creek after being away, running my dad's restaurant, and then having now having our own and being back on Shim Creek. It's just a complete uh, amazing. It's a, it's an incredible incredible thing. But uh, yeah, yeah. But thanks for having us on. No, thank yeah, you. Eric. One thing, we, one thing we all like to say: we have graduated from USC, which is not the University of South Carolina, but the University of Shim Creek. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> the re- that's the real USC, huh? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of restaurateurs around that um, that kind of learn the business over there on Shim Creek. Yeah, working with my dad. Yeah, there's a whole list of them out there that are still around. Actually, they learn from dad. Well, I, I remember when you think Shim Creek, I remember the Avengers, John and Angie Avenger, all those folks who were out there. Well, there's John Keener that has Charleston Crab House, yep. Joe Norton that has Tzatziki's, and Ron Hill that has the uh, with, with the works with Dan Dole that has the Crab Shack. All those guys were uh, trained underneath my dad and worked beside Brett and myself during some wild and crazy times on the creek. Wow. <laughs> so let's talk about the partnership. Now, you guys have been – best friends for such a long time. You've seen each other get probably get married. You've seen children uh, come about. Do you know each other uh, uh, better than anyone? So how do you, better than my wife, how, how do you make a partnership last that long? Because a, a lot Go of times ahead. you'll see a partnership not work. So how do you do it? Yeah. You know, we get asked that question a lot and, um, and it, I think it's really having the same life, goals is going you know we're both going in the same direction with the same goals um and we really both put each other's interests kind of above ourselves or before ourselves Mm -hmm. um and it's crazy it it is it works a a good partnership i think works just like a good marriage um and the funny thing if you knew wade's wife and my wife my wife has a personality that's fairly similar to wade and wade's wife has a a personality that's very similar to mine. Wow. Um, it's so weird how those personalities um, go. But yeah, so Wade and I, when, when way back when we were in high school, we started cutting wood together before school and after school. We had a grass cutting business. Uh, we've been hustling since, uh, since we were 14. Uh, I, old enough to drive, I can remember we used to use his dad's truck. To- Cut. We go get up early in the morning before we go to school and go cut out a load of wood and leave it in the woods. Right. And come back after school and get it and split it and put it. And we lived in Steve Farm, and sell it at the front of Steve Farm after school. But we have been hustling ever since. You know that's that's amazing. Uh, that's just amazing. Like you guys have put in the work. So for some, they may think like, well, these guys have always had it easy. They don't understand. You've been getting hand, your hands dirty for a long time. Oh yeah. For a long time. <laughs> And so I, the partnership, the upbringing, do those things still help you today in how you manage your businesses? Oh, 100%. Um, I mean, the wisdom and experience that Wade and I have gained over the last 30 years, you know, as crazy as the last four or five months have been, um, because, you know, being in business for yourself is, is uh, Wade used a great term yesterday when we were in operating operations meeting, shifting sand. You know, things are constantly changing and we're having to constantly adjust. And um, as we've done that all through our career, it's, it's really kind of gave us the tools we've needed to get through the last few months. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is a lifetime of experience. You know, I, I like that term, uh, shifting sand. But how, uh, you know, all those lifetime of experiences, I mean, I'm no young fellow myself, but I'm wondering, how does all that we've been through, or you've been through, prepare you for what we're doing right now? Because this is something different, like we've never seen before. Uh, You know, I'm seeing, uh, you know, family businesses that were built up over 20, 30 years shut down at the snap of a finger, you know? In a matter of weeks, things were just on pause. So... How do you cope with right now? Well, I'll tell you, you know, I can speak for me here and myself only. I'm a faith-driven person. And I, I'll be honest with you. I, I turn to, to, to my higher power every single day, multiple times a day, and ask for guidance and direction. Um, and, I've, and, and, I, and I get wisdom and answer and direction from, 
from my higher power every single day. And there's no doubt in my mind that, uh, that my faith is leading me with uh, um, the opposite of fear is faith. And I've seen a lot of fear and I immediately drop to my knees and pray and ask that God gives me uh, faith that he's going to take me through that. So that's my answer for that part of it. The other part of it is, is what Brett mentioned earlier is just experience and being able to have to, you take that, you know, underneath your fit, feet are shifting sand and you're constantly have to adjust to be able to stay upright. And um, it is very difficult. And during these times, it's been very difficult. Mm-hmm. There's been times where, where all of a sudden you get a notice where you're, you know, you're, you've got a, you're down to 40% or 20% occupancy availability. Uh, and, and how do you ad- adapt and change? We went from mm-hmm. having 220 employees to seven. To seven. Seven. How do you get to seven? From 220 to seven. And how do you deal with that and the emotional impact that it takes on you? Being a, a person, you know, you feel responsible for everybody that works with you. You know, their livelihood, they depend on you and the way you operate your business. Oh, yeah. And I can tell you, those are all things that, that, that you have to think about. And I'm just very thankful that I have a partner beside me that we can throw all of these questions off to each other and eventually come to the middle with what we would consider to be the best solution or the best answer to the problem. No. I'm just glad I'm not walking it alone. That, that's a great response. Great response. Uh, I think the one thing that people just don't understand, they think once you get the business license, you get the building, you hang the shingle and everything, or you are some CEO, they think that everything stops. That's when it gets harder, right? It gets harder right. that way. Right. And like you said, you went from over 200 employees to seven and what people have to understand and realize is that you go to bed with that on you. You go to bed with that and you wake up with that. And when you are the CEO or the president of anything, all of that burden falls on you. It falls on you. So in an industry right now, the restaurant industry, like, uh, you know, there was a time where restaurants had to shut down, you know, how do you adapt? You know, how do you adapt to say, you know what, I'm going to do the curbside or or I can go with the 50 percent occupancy. How, how do you adapt? Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, that's the entrepreneurial spirit that I think drives most of the economy is like, you know, put an obstacle in front of me and we'll figure out a way to, to overcome it. Um, you know, it's so amazing how our business just on Shim Creek has changed. You know, the front door is not where the front door used to be because we found a better way to move traffic to our restaurant as we have adapted to the changing conditions. Um, and there's a whole lot of other what I would call best practices that we've learned over the last few months that I think a lot of people have, um, including what we're doing today, sitting yep. here on Zoom. Absolutely. Having to, you know, travel to see each other. Um and so, yeah, it's just that, you know, I'm not going to be defeated attitude of we'll get it done one way or another. Um, and, you know, there, there's Wade and our little circle has the nickname of Bulldog because once he thinks it's even, but he ain't letting go until wow. it gets real. Well, I like <laughs> and, that. And, and that's, you know, a lot of times everybody's ready to give up the Wade and he's like, no, we're He's not going to take no for an answer. Um, and, there, you know, there's countless stories I can tell you about that attitude that persevered at the late night and what seems like the 11th hour of, of doom and gloom when we've made it work. And, you know, Eric, some of our competitive uh, peers, and I call them competitive peers because that's really what they are, is uh, we've got some competitive peers, uh, true friends out there that are in this business. That some don't have it as fortunate as we do mm-hmm. be it be a location or capacity or whatever the case, case may be. And, you know, they're very resilient. I've got a, we've got a few uh, of our neighbors that have adapted and changed according to uh, the dynamics of the, of this COVID that's out here and the, the governmental government restrictions have come about. I'm so impressed with the, with the thinking and ingenuity some of our some of our competitive peers have come up with. I know that uh, 
my neighbor, I use uh, Courtney Page as an example, Page's Oak Grill right across the street. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, she, she she's such a go-getter, smart, aggressive, positive thinking y- young lady. And I call her a young lady. She's a woman, you know, a successful business person. But I admire her right. so much because of her tenacity and her ability to adapt and change as the environment changes. You know, she, I, she and I uh, exchanged texts. She's got down to six kitchen employees at one time. And instead of being defeated and shut down, she says, we're just going to do takeout and we're going to market it. And she aggressively does it on social media and takes, shows pictures of how amazing her food is. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, I just, I just admire, as Brett said, you know, we adapt and change and, yeah. and uh, you know, some have been more successful than others, but speaking of Courtney and, and specifically, she's just a, She's the kind of person that that I can call my friend, and uh, the word competitive peer is what I is what I'd like to use. And there's a lot of us out there, and some haven't been so fortunate. But uh, you have to have that tenacity and that drive to to stay going during these changing times, for sure. No, I agree with that. I, I think uh, it's a really good thing when you do have like you call them competitive peers. There has to be other people that you look at, and you almost get motivated yourself to continue going on by seeing those people. The beauty of your partnership, it seems like, you know, uh, I and I quote this this new nickname, Wade Bulldog Bowls here, right? <laughs> so uh, when I address you on social media, I'm going to start saying Wade Bulldog Bowls. So, but, you know, you have that ability to reach out to Brett, you know, when there's something troubling you or there's a, a situation that you face together and you can put your heads together uh, and come out of it. What is some advice that you would give uh, some of the, the newer or younger restaurateurs. Grab that, Brett. Well, yeah. So, you know, uh, on that light, you know, we, and we both use this quote all the time, more light comes in through two windows than one. So, um, you know, we always run our solution by each other. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the restaurant business is, is driven by control. Um, you know, everybody thinks that it's all the, fancy food and, and nice service and all those are very, very important. But like any other business is control. You know, we operate on very thin margins and, you know, if food is wasted or or stuff goes out the back door, that can be the end of the business. And a lot of restaurant guys don't even know what their food cost is or where their cost is or what yeah. percentage their rent is. And those are all numbers that have to fit into a formula. And um, that's probably one of the first things that, you know, restaurant 101 is, is get your formula together and then make sure you can operate within that. Yeah. Um, really, um, step one. And then to be well capitalized in this business because there's a lot of ups and downs and, and uh, being prepared for, for the cold, rainy nights because they come. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, here's what I want to do. I want to take a break and I want to come back and I want to talk about uh, being capitalized and the cold, rainy nights that you just brought up, Brett. Uh, This is the AdCast. Today's show is sponsored in part by Craft Creative. Change your creative. Change your world with premium video production and graphic design. Get started by visiting WeCraftCreative.com. You don't need a marketing agency. You do deserve very important placement. VIP Marketing and Advertising is a cutting-edge strategic digital, creative, media, and marketing partner that provides services for businesses of all sizes. To stay up to date on the latest marketing news, subscribe for email updates at veryimportantplacement.com. You're listening to The AdCast, the podcast for marketers and advertisers with your host, Eric Elliott. All right, I am back with my uh, two, uh, two guests here, Mr. Wade Bowles and Brett Yearout. Uh, and in the beginning part, right prior to the break, we were actually talking about how they came together and some of the interesting things that restaurateurs actually go through. And uh, let me ask you this, guys. Uh, you know, how have you marketed your places different um, now versus prior to? Wait, kind of a marketing guy. I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. How, how, what's the difference in how you guys market your, your restaurant now versus pre COVID? Oh, so, uh, you know, in this, this new 
technological world, it, everything's about social media, and, it's, uh, and you have to be you have to be conscious of of how you market. You know, your with the social distancing and all like that. And um, you know, we've really had to step back and say, you know, what's the right prudent thing to do. And, mm-hmm. and we first start off when we couldn't open up for dining service. It was all about pick up and take out. And yeah. being a locally owned uh, business, our our our, you know, we we had some fear there that you know, are we gonna? Uh, is our local customers would do they want to come to Saltwater Cowboys and have pick up food, uh, take out food versus sitting on that deck, which you can't do now. Right. So we really had to work hard on trying to get uh, promote our fresh local products, uh, produce came from Arthur Brown over there, Roots Roots, uh, Pro, uh, Roots Produce Stand, and some of our fish from Mark over at Abundant Seafood and some of the fresh local shrimp from Tommy Edwards on the uh, shrimp boat Playboy. Uh, we really needed to promote that we were buying all local products or as much as possible, local products for, for local people to come and enjoy because there was no church. There was no out-of-towners visiting and, and enjoying what would typically be going on in the spring and summer. So we, we, we had to step back a minute and think, say, you know, what do we need to do? And we'll well, our locals support us, and part of the way was basically tacking on to that, saying we're buying local fresh stuff. Uh, come, come get it. And uh, I can remember making trips up to McClellanville and some the Buford getting fresh soft shell crabs as they were as they were molting and bringing them back as fast as I could. Mm-hmm. I couldn't get enough in. I couldn't get enough in before everybody was buying them out. It wow. was just, I, I remember kind of seeing stuff. you post that. I saw that. Yeah, I mean, people loved it, you know, and that's where we that's where we adjusted and changed. Um, we just kind of we kind of pivoted and went to, to base you know, the basics and the roots of what we were doing. Um, you know, remember we told you we went down to seven people. Yeah. So you know, we kept the members of management that we could. And everybody hustled. Everybody got in and and uh, and did what they had to do. So that's kind of part, that's a quick little story about how we had to adjust and change. And as things have kind of changed a little bit, we've opened up with social distancing and uh, moving our table structure where people are further apart and safer and adapting a cleaning program that's uh, a three-part system, making sure that everybody feels safe. Uh, All those were things that we had to adjust to as as times change. So that's kind of the answer to that. Do you feel like... uh there's a lot more community or local support now in restaurants uh, than there's ever been before. Right. Yeah. I think that was probably one of the most amazing things that came out of the whole experience is, uh, you know, we're a very busy restaurant and, Mm -hmm. you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people a day, you know, are through there and you don't get a chance to really meet a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And when we were shut down, we had friends in the community who, had um, needs of, you know, ordering lunch for their office or buying gift cards in bulk. Um, and for these friends to come out of the woodwork and literally keep us alive and afloat yeah, man. in the month of April was just, you know, we had to do the whole social distancing thing. But when you had a customer come up and get those off shell crabs or, or whatever, you just wanted to hug them and like, my goodness, yeah. thank you for coming to visit us. It's, it's like, good. I didn't know you loved me this much, right? Yeah, it's a beautiful thing, Brett. Thanks for bringing that up. I just think it was such. It was. I mean, you really did. You wanted to give them a hug. You wanted to thank them. I got a friend of mine that's in my one of my men's uh, small groups. He he basically for the first two days of opening, fed his he had an office building. He fed his entire office building staff for two days. I mean, I I just I mean, I tears just came down my my face, and I was so grateful and thankful for it. I mean. The local support was just absolutely amazing, Eric. It really was. I, you just did. You don't realize it till it happens, and what they do for you is just amazing. I, I always hmm. try and find uh, a blessing in every burden that I go through. What would you, the both of you, say has been the blessing in this burden that has been COVID as of recently? And I really, I don't think it, I don't ever look at it as a burden. I even look at it, you know, kind of a lesson maybe. Um, but I really, you know, it almost goes back to what we were talking about earlier. I just, I know it's the depth of my heart 
this is all working out in our best interest. I know that. And so I may not like parts of it, mm-hmm. and I may not understand much of it, but at the end of the day, I know that this is working out in our best interest. And if we had hours to talk here, I could tell you some examples of things that have happened in the last six months that would just blow your mind. Um, through this chaos and pain, this is all working out just extraordinary. Brett and I have had these moments where we, we come to each other, Eric, mm-hmm. and we go, oh, my gosh, can you really believe that this is happening and unfolding this way? It was, it's was. it been the most beautiful experience. It hasn't been – I don't know how to say it. It's, I mean, again, I go back to my faith. I, it's like, see there? Yeah. See what's happening here? Can't explain it. it, it it's It's crazy. Some of the stuff has been unbelievable. We could go into this and talk probably for a good hour or two about some of the examples, but uh, Brett knows what I'm talking about. I mean, I, I'll give you a quick example. I mean, it's the most amazing thing. So, you know, back in February, we had just reopened up uh, a restaurant in North Charleston, mm-hmm. was moving down the road with that, had hooked seafood, which we had just renovated the year before, getting ready for its first full big year, just yeah. set up for a few years. Saltwater Cowboys was chugging along, and we thought we were on top of everything. We had a fire on February the 29th. I, and I, I remember, remember. I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. Like, oh my goodness, this is like the worst thing that could ever have happened. The timing, the week before the tourist season, just catastrophic. Um, and then we had to remind ourselves, like, hey, you got to trust the process. You know, I don't understand it. And, you know, now you go to downtown Charleston, those poor guys that, that have businesses in downtown Charleston are really suffering because they're yeah. not the tourist. And if we were, thankfully, we were still closed um, for repairs. And if that was an opening, open enterprise right now, we'd be struggling really difficult. And so that fire was good luck, bad luck. Who knows? Kind of a blessing. You know, we've got the ability to, you know, that you know, switch you pay insurance for and, uh, you know, we're not open for operations. We displaced uh, some of our staff, uh, or as many of our people. We moved them straight over to Saltwater to gave them jobs. Very good, uh, very good. And you no, know, we, we 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 kept those folks, gave them an opportunity to come over and work for us. And uh, and uh, you look like what Brett just said. You look at some of the business environment just downtown, and you know, by the time we get back ready to get back into construction, get back open, spring spring will be circling back around again, and uh, you know, those are those are the unsung blessings, the unanswered prayers that you just don't realize until something like this. I mean, COVID happened three weeks after that. Wow! It's just like wow, ah, how did this happen? Yeah. Uh, and it, and those kind of stories go on and on and on during this during this time. And and if I can divert a little bit, I have to tell you, uh, the time that I've been able to spend with my family during this uh, this time where everybody's Having to stay inside has been the most beautiful thing. Um, as crazy as this sounds, I've got to be able. You to get to see what you were missing. Time. Saw what I was missing, Eric. You know, I saw what I was missing. Uh, I learned to be a plumber, an electrician, uh, a landscaper. Uh, you name it, I learned to be it. But more importantly, is I learned to be the dad, the father, uh, and the friend, um, and had time to do it, and really got. A close relationship with uh, with my family that because of this crazy busy business that I'm in, I didn't always get to have. So there's a blessing and a silver lining in everything. Now, Brett and Wade. Now, I started out in the restaurant industry years and years ago, and I know you put in the work and you put in the hours. How do you find the balance? How do you find the that's balance? What the partners for. That's what. That's why he's a partner because we. He was working. He and my, I was. He and I were working for my dad. I was running my dad's businesses, even though Brett and I were actually in partnerships with my dad in a couple different places. But I was running the operations. Mm-hmm. And when we decided to split off, as my dad started downsizing, you know, the opportunity came to to break away. And both of us said we had young kids at the time, and I I didn't want to grow up not knowing my dad as I as I really didn't as I was a child, know my father, because he lived in the restaurant. Yep. And we said, this is worth having a partnership. 
and we divided our time. We divided our responsibilities. We divided everything. It was, you know, and I, and we're the perfect yin and yang. Uh, and there is a lot of hours, but, but, you know, when we first started out, we were ran, running our business ourselves 100%. We split our schedule, but so that means we split our time. Very smart. Uh, you know, we just, it wasn't all about the, you know, the dollar bill. It was about the quality of life. Um, and I'll tell you, Brett, I think we'll concur with that. You know, by, by that, you know, I'm a family man. He's a family man in the restaurant business. You don't get a lot of family people, yeah. you know, because they have, they have their, to have their passion. I mean, my father was in love with his business. He loved his family, but he was in love with his business. Yeah. So he spent most of his time there and bringing on a partner as we both did with each other, sharing that responsibility. And I think that's helped me with our success too. How, how I mean, you, I've been married for 30 years, man. <laughs> and then that's how you do it, man. How, how about you, Brett? Same thing? Yeah, so it was very intentional. You know, when we started this um, back, you know, when we broke away from his dad back in 1999, we had a very uh, a conversation like, I don't want to end up like a lot of people I see around us, divorced and broken families and all kind of other lifestyle issues. Okay. Uh, you know, we're going to be um, smart about how we run our lives. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to let those things happen to us. And uh, for the most part, we've been very successful with that. I and mean, we're both still married and moving down the road. Um, so, um, you know, it was the intention of, uh, of that balance from the very beginning. Now, another thing, too, that's really important, too, is having the right people in the right seats, having the right staff behind you, too, because... Uh, people have to understand and realize that it's not you two doing it, you know, 24 hours a day or, or 12 hours a day that you're open. How important is it to have the right staff or having a great team with you to promote that brand or that vision you have? It's the number one issue. Uh, you know, I, I can't, you know, visit every table or see every customer. You know, it's the, the servers that, that see every customer and it's the, the line cooks and the dishwashers who make sure everything's right, the managers. I mean, it is the number one thing on our plate on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. daily basis. Taking care of staff, supporting them, training them. I mean. Empowering them. Having them be able to make decisions based on the standards and guidelines that we, that our restaurant lives within. There's no, no more important thing, as Brett said, than staff, having the right staff. Absolutely. And supporting them. You know, there's, there's a saying, I think the guy from um, Richard Branson from uh, the airline yeah. said, you know, the most important thing, most people say, what's the most important thing? And people say, oh, your customers. And he says, no, it's our staff. I agree. And, you know, we not have adopted that attitude. It's like, you know, that, that really, if, I, if we make sure we have a happy, motivated, energized staff, then they're going to take care of the customers and all the problems resolve themselves. Do you remember when Johnson and Wales was in Charleston and it was almost easier to get, you know, line cooks and everything else? Uh, how much has it changed now in terms of staffing the restaurant? How much has that changed in the last 15 years? Well, I can tell you the balance of power, and, and, and I think overall this is a healthy thing, the balance of power has shifted away from management and ownership to the employee level. Um, wages have gone up dramatically, um, particularly over the last probably five years, um, which is a great thing. Um, you know, minimum wage is not even a conversation that anybody's ever had in the last five, ten years. I don't even um, know what it is. We don't ever pay anybody that. Yeah, and so it's certainly, you know, the balance of power shifting so dramatically you know, we have to pay attention to what the needs of our staff are and making sure the working conditions are absolutely as comfortable and as, as efficient and safe as possible. Um, pay rates are very competitive. I mean, you know, there are not enough restaurant hospitality people in Charleston to service all the restaurants in Charleston. So we're in competition for each other. So really, who can treat me the best? Yeah is who I'm going to work for. In, in order to kind of stay at the top of your game, do you guys have to pay attention to other brands or, or look at what other, other industries are doing to say like, 
hey, let's apply, let's apply that process to here. Um, one of the places I am so impressed with is Chick-fil-A. I'm impressed with their process, you know? It's not like, you know, cause we did a, a taste test one time on the chicken sandwich, and while they give great service, they didn't have the best chicken sandwich, but they were consistent. They were Eric, consistent. You're looking at Brett as their number one customer. Let, Brett's got to tell a story. He knows everything about the philosophy. That you name it, he's a Chick-fil-A. I, yeah, I have such respect for the guy. Um, their whole operation, and, and you can ask any of our managers. I'm like, if we can just come close to being as good as Chick-fil-A, yeah. then we got it going on, you know? That, that you know, there's a, a thing out there, you know, I can only hope to treat you as well as Chick fil A Chick fil A treat, treats you. Yeah. Um, they they really got it going on. And I and I preach those, you know. You do. This model and their level of customer service is, is beyond second to none. It really is. Their model there's some YouTube training videos on there their uh for their staff. You go YouTube and you 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 be highly as a business owner and a restaurateur you pull this stuff up and the model works for anybody that that is in the customer service industry, yeah. but particularly ours. They're, great that you brought that up, um, but Brett happens to be their number one fan as well as probably number one customer. Well, <laughs> you know, the thing about it, I don't care if you go to Chick-fil-A in Mount Pleasant or you go to Chick-fil-A in Hollywood, South Carolina, if there is one there, they're all the same. Yeah, They run them all impeccably well. So now, Brett, I mean, we're finding out so many things about you guys. Wade the Bulldog Bowls and Brett no, Chick-fil-A number one Fran year out. So do, when you are actually like when you patron, you're a patron of a Chick-fil-A uh, and you're trying to bring some of these things back, do you also look at other brands to say like that's impressive or do you just go out to eat to do your own research? Well, that's one of the great things that we get to do is we try, we, we do, we, and, and we haven't obviously lately, but travel to some of these bigger cities where a lot of these cutting trends that are going on. Mm -hmm. uh, we're usually in Boston every spring for the seafood show, and Chicago is a great restaurant town. Las Vegas is a great restaurant town. And yeah, we love to go to those places and see what, what people are coming up with. We call that comparative dining, and uh, and we do. And I... And, and that's kind of my area that, uh, that I focus on a lot. Uh, I, I watch what other brands are doing, be it menus, customer service, uh, their decor, their atmosphere. Uh, I, I try my best to stay on the cutting edge of that. You know, it's kind of like one of those things. If you're not evolving or changing, you become uh, like a dinosaur. And what did the dinosaurs do? They ruled the world during time, but they're now extinct. I don't, I'm not interested. I'm getting older. But I'm not ready to be extinct, uh, uh, and um, so we're so I'm constantly out there looking and searching and seeing what what uh, the other guy's doing, um, and how, and can I adapt that to to my brand and my model? No, I think that's awesome. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna actually take a break, and I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna tell you why you two are my favorite restaurant tours. Bet you want to know, oh, right? Hey. All right. This is the AdCast. Thank you, Eric. To hear your questions answered on a future segment, send them to eric at heyimeric.com. Live from VIP Marketing Studio, this is the AdCast. All right. So we are back with Mr. Wade Bowles and Mr. Brett Yearout. And uh, right before the break, I told you I'm going to tell you why these guys are my favorite restaurant tours. If you notice, you, I, I saw you move a little bit, Brett, over there. Brett's like, okay, what's about to happen? All right. There was a young me a long time ago, and I had hustled really hard. I used to be in media uh, years ago. I worked in uh, radio and television sales years ago. And I, my wife and I, we had some money and we said, you know, let's put on an event. And I wanted to do an oyster festival on the fairgrounds. I approached, um, you had a manager by the name of Brian, I think it was at the time. And I approached the two of you guys and you guys helped me with ordering tons of oysters and, and giving me some tips and advice to be able to put on that event. And you didn't ask me for a dime, not one single dime. 
Um, you may not remember that, but I do. And I do remember. <laughs> and and then there was another time. I had dined in uh, your restaurant in North Charleston at the time when it was a seafood restaurant, and there was a young lady. I, I can't. I, I believe her name was Mary, and she gave us the best service, hands down, that I've ever had in any restaurant from anyone. And here's why she stood out. Um, she was having some, you know, some dental cosmetic things happening at the time, and we tipped her a hundred dollars. And she cried. She cried, and she came over to us at the table, and she said, was this a mistake? And so she, at first she went to the manager and then came to us, and she said, well, guys, was, you know, she said, was this a mistake? We said, no. You were amazing. She catered to our children first, so she made them happy before she made us happy. And I remember this like it was yesterday, and I even remember everything that I had. I had the she crab soup, and I think I had a bacon-wrapped shrimp, I want to say. Um, and she was fantastic from start to finish. And she was in the people business. She made sure that our dining experience was top notch. And so when I hear you guys say the things that you're saying right now on this podcast, I know it all to be true because I've seen it from you. So I want to tell you that people pay attention and, uh, they remember those good things. And that's a pat on the back for the both of you. Yeah, wow, Eric, thank you. I, I did not realize, I know that I heard that story about uh, Mary up there. I did not know that was you. Um, I can relate to you that she was able to get her teeth fixed. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That is so beautiful. So, what a beautiful uh, story, my friend. So, um, you know, that's that's something, uh, you know, you guys did that. And, and I think uh, what you do in your restaurant, it, it spreads, man. It spreads. So, uh, you know, thank being faith based and also having a good partnership. Uh, it starts at the top because if you were horrible, your people would be horrible and you're not. So uh, that says a whole lot about you guys. All right. So what Thanks. we're going to do, we're going to wrap things up and we're going to go into something called the lightning round. OK. Oh. You hear that? So when we uh, here's what's going to happen in the lightning round. I'm going to ask you about certain mediums. I'll ask you about radio. You tell me your thoughts on radio. I ask you about billboard. Tell me your thoughts on billboard, television, social media. Um, there's no wrong answer at all. It's just your honest opinion on what works and how does it work for you or what you think is effective or not. Okay. You ready? All right. Ready. So, so, uh, let's go, let's go television. So television for our industry, I don't think is effective. Wait, right. I, I agree. Okay. That was quick. <laughs> let's go. Uh, how about radio? So, so radio has worked for us uh, um, in, in its time. Um, we, we did uh, a couple big campaigns, digital and the digital. I don't want to get into that yet. But yeah, radio has worked for us specifically. Uh, we've been in radio uh, almost since he and I have been in partnership, on and off. Um, would you, Brett? Yeah, I think the radio has been effective for us, particularly in, in building the brand. Um, we've really used the radio probably primarily over on the solar cowboy for, for the first two years. How about uh, social media? I happen to love it. I think that uh, there's a uh, science to it that is still trying to be figured out. Um, um, we have some, we have somebody that manages our social media platforms, uh, be it website, uh, Instagram, Facebook, it's a constant uh, issue with us. The website's not so much, but you got to have that SEO search engine optimization going on to, go. to be a, to be to be found and, and constantly attracted to the people that are uh, searching for you. Um, uh, but I believe social media is powerful and is definitely where things are going. Um, it, there's some means in uh, of being able to track. Uh, how people are finding you, uh, interactions and stuff like that. But yes, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of it. Yeah, so that's a double-edged sword. Um, you know, it, it works great, but it, it, it can, it, I mean, Isn't that true? there's no hiding from the public on social media. 
Yeah. Somebody's unhappy, they're going to let you know. Good or bad, um, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't think there's probably, you know, if I just use my own self, if I'm out of town and I'm looking for a place to eat, where do I do? I get on my phone and I start Googling or Google Chip Advisor or some other social website. Yeah. You know, and that's how I find a place to eat. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's really the driver of the bus, I think, right now. Well, here's what I tell a lot of businesses now. You know, man, we do things across the country, and I'll tell people, you know, I came from a radio and television background, but radio and television actually cost you more money than anything. They cost you more money, uh, and the truth is you get uh, an inexpensive click on social media, and not only that, you're able to target exactly who you want. If you wanted to target within five miles of your restaurant, you could. Give them that message, you could. Um, I believe it is probably the best outlet for, uh, especially your industry. Uh, you could be more specific and you could be more budget conscious if you are marketing on social media. There is a science to it, and it's not as easy as just saying, you know, hey, my daughter can do it um, or my niece can do it. There is a science to it that I would think any and every restaurateur or business person, they should definitely look into. Uh, it has a lot more power, and I think it is the new media. Uh, and I always say traditional media, which is newspaper, television, radio, billboard, those things are about the width of your wallet, about how much you can buy. And new media, which is the social and the SEO, that's the width of your brain. And so that's where you have to do a lot more thinking there. So how about billboard advertising, guys? So we really, we've never messed with that. It's very expensive. Um, and so we've never, we've never used it. We've been approached, uh, a former radio guy that now works for Adams uh, Advertising, a friend of mine. I don't know if you know Richard uh, Jordan. Uh, oh, yeah, I know Richard. Yeah, so he works with Adams and um, Jay Conroy. Good people. You know great Jay. People. Great people. Uh, those guys that were former radio guys are now in the billboard uh, uh, business, and, and they've approached me. I've just, as Brett said, it's an expensive uh thing i'm not saying it doesn't work i i don't I, we can't say we know wow well gentlemen i go ahead they're kind of, they're kind of hard to get to too because i think all the trial attorneys have all of them <laughs> i'm responsible i'm sorry i'm sorry i bet you are i know I yeah <laughs> well yeah. i will tell sure you thought. guys uh i am i have enjoyed my time speaking to both of you today um, uh, and do this for me. Let's, let's tell, uh, the audience, cause we've talked about saltwater cowboys a little bit. Tell the audience, uh, give me the website address. I want to know about saltwater audience, saltwater cowboys. I want to be able to send some folks there. Well, well, saltwater cowboys is right there on Shim Creek and Mount Pleasant. Um, our, our web is web address is www.saltwater-cowboys.com. And if you haven't been, you're missing it. It's the best view on Shim Creek. It's the only place on Shim Creek that serves fresh local seafood and pit cooked barbecue. And I got to tell you, if you haven't been there, you're missing it. Wow. What do you think, Brad? Yeah, when you walk around, the, you know, when you, when you first enter our place, you just see the building. When you walk around the corner and you're on the deck, it's the most unobstructed you really transformed uh, into a different, almost a different place. I mean, it's like being on vacation. Yeah. It's the fastest way to own, on, be on vacation. You, you get in a vacation state of mind. So I didn't ask you, where the name Saltwater Cowboys come from? <laughs> Go ahead, Brett, you tell. So I would love to tell you that it's the absolute creative genius of our partnership, but I can't tell you that. So, Years and years ago, when we, the Noisy Oyster was originally being built, Wade and I had to drive all the way down to Fort Lauderdale to get this 12-foot shark that we were going to put on the roof. I, I, re- I remember that shark. <laughs> yeah, so Wade and I had to go get that shark. And while we were on the way down there, we stopped in this place in St. Augustine called Saltwater Cowboys, and we just loved the name. And the place is nothing like our place. It's a, it's a lot closer to fine dining than ours is. So we just loved the name. Yeah, And it just stuck with us for years and so when this project came about you know way was like, what do you think about saltwater cowboys and i was like i love it but can we use it and we found out that it was not trademarked in south carolina so so think about it saltwater seafood cowboys barbecue it just fits it fits it fits yeah 
Wade Bowles, Brett Yearout, it's been a pleasure. I want to thank you guys for being uh, our guest today. And also, uh, just thank you for giving us your most valuable asset, which is your time. So we thank you so much. This is the AdCast. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, man. been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. For including us. If you feel this podcast has been a help to you or could be a help to others, please don't forget to subscribe. You can listen to our podcast anywhere, iHeart, Spotify, Apple Music, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And this episode is also going to be available on YouTube. To catch up on past episodes, go to heyimeric.com, or you can always text me at 843-483-1555. Copyright VIP Marketing and Advertising, produced by Craft Creative. For premium video production and graphic design, visit WeCraftCreative.com.